Well, hello from New Zealand, uh, and welcome to this broadcast, which is being done in a clever technological way. I'm David Carruthers. I'm a, uh, I've been a judge for 30 years here in New Zealand. I used to be the Chief District Court Judge, then I was Chairman of our Parole Board, and now I chair our Independent Police Conduct Authority. And with me for this conversation is my good friend, Professor Chris Marshall. Uh, Chris has recently been appointed as Chair, the first Chair, in Restorative Justice at Victoria University of Wellington. And Chris and I have gathered at the command of Hannah <laughs> to talk uh, today about the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, New Zealand's implementation of that, and in particular how restorative justice practices uh, can find a useful part to play in the implementation of the Convention. And Chris, it would be helpful, I think, right from the start, if you were to outline to our international audience what the principles of restorative justice are, so that we can then talk about how they might be included in this critically important Convention and the way which promotes rights of the disabled. Mm, sure. Perhaps I'll just read a very short definition from John Braithwaite, who's one of the great um, voices in this field, and then make some observations about it. He defines restorative justice as a process whereby all the parties with a stake in a particular offence come together in a safe and controlled environment to share their feelings and opinions truthfully and to resolve how best to deal with the aftermath and its implications for the future. So it's a pretty standard way of understanding restorative justice as a process that brings people together to talk about a harm that's occurred and how to, how to repair it. It rests on certain important and very distinctive assumptions. Uh, one is the, uh, the assumption that we should think of a crime or a wrong primarily as a harm done to a person and the damage done to a relationship. It's not just a legal issue, it's not just a moral issue. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a matter of injury that is uh, being caused. Secondly, that the best way to respond to harms or crimes is to work to repair the damage and especially to repair the relationships that have been affected by, by, the, uh, by, the, by the action. And of course that requires that the wrongdoer takes responsibility for, for his or her actions. Thirdly, the best way to promote that kind of repair is to involve all the parties who have a stake in the incident. The victim, the offender, uh, their friends and family, members of the wider community, to involve them all together in, uh, in discussing what happened and deciding how it, can be, how it can be restored or repaired. The kind of repair that restorative justice aims for is, is, is partly emotional or moral, so uh, is often a, an important opportunity for somebody to apologise for their actions. It's partly material if there is some um, physical or, or financial restitution that is needed. Um, and it's partly rehabilitative, addressing the causes of the wrong and trying to prevent it from happening again. So, I mean, that's, I think that's the heart of restorative justice. If I had to pick out some key principles, which I think will apply to our discussion about people with dis disabilities, I, I pick out six. Now, one is a voluntary process. So people are there because they want to be there, not because they're forced to be there by the law. Uh, secondly, it's an inclusive process. It tries to include all the people who have a stake uh, in the incident. Thirdly, it's a democratic process, so it's not run by professionals. Um, it's, it's the participants who are the chief decision makers in the process. Uh, fourthly, it's, there's a need for accountability, so it's not a matter of ignoring or downplaying the harm, but taking responsibility for it. Uh, fifthly, it's focused on victims in particular and the needs that have been created and it's focused on harm. It's focused on, on trying to identify the harm that's been caused and to repair it. And, f and, and finally, it, it must be a respectful process. So people aren't there to attack each other or, or, or even to condemn each other. Uh, they're there to engage respectfully around, around the problem and see if they can fix it. Well, I think that's a very helpful start, and, and two key things that I take out of uh, what you've just said, which will be relevant to the obligations under the Convention, 
uh, about relationships, which I gather is at the heart of restorative justice, and also um, respect mm. uh, and inclusion. Yep. Because the obligations and responsibilities which the Convention places on a state which are about promoting and protecting and monitoring the human rights of those with disabilities are clearly going to involve families and professionals and others in ways which um, easily fit within the definition you've just given us. And although sometimes there are coercive powers exercised by the state, I'm thinking particularly of criminal cases where there has to be tests met about insanity or fitness to plead and so forth, they still involve all of the people who are connected yeah. Um, yeah. and who all need to be involved if in a small connected country we are to achieve inclusiveness and proper respect mm -hmm. and efficacy. Do you see anything difficult about applying restorative principles to those sorts of concepts which are not actually criminal matters <coughs> but sometimes can be? Um. I think restorative, <coughs> restorative approaches can be applied in non-criminal areas. If, if we hmm. say there's a problem, which often means that people are, are hurting in some way, uh, then I think a restorative approach has a contribution to make. It, it will look different, I'm sure, in every case. But I think it, it has a, a particular um, set of principles and, and priorities that can be worked out in, in all kinds of cases, I think. Well, um the only countries that accede to the, this convention are countries that have a certain maturity um, and who want to show respect uh, to all the citizens yeah. of its country uh, and, to, uh, and are prepared to honour the promises that are made. And one of the challenges which we face in New Zealand, but um, everyone who accedes to this treaty would, are challenges about education. And giving the same opportunities to those who are disabled as those who are not. Have you had experience of um, RJ being used in education fields and has that been successful? Certainly the use of restorative, they often call them restorative practices rather than restorative justice because we're, yeah. we're dealing with children. The use of restorative practices in schools is a very developed and I think a very exciting area. and. Um, what, what, I, what, what, what impresses me about the use of restorative uh, mechanisms in schools is that they move beyond the idea that we, we are simply dealing with an isolated wrong and they talk about how do we as a community, as a school community, live together and mm -hmm. relate together in a way that is respectful and restorative and inclusive. Um, and the schools in New Zealand that have embraced restorative approaches uh, often experience a complete transformation of the school culture in fact, I was, I was uh, in Christchurch in the weekend giving a lecture and one of the people who does training in schools was at the lecture and she said that, uh, that high schools in Christchurch are now noticing the difference uh, mm. of children, the children who have come through primary schools that have been restorative. So when they get That's to high wonderful. school, they, they can pick the difference. Yeah. These children have learned mm. ways of handling uh, you know, problems uh, that are, are, are non-violent, that they are respectful, they're inclusive. So, um, so I think certainly there's a big, you know, there's a big place for a startup. Well, in turn, those are going to pose challenges for those of us who work in the criminal justice field because people will come with quite sure. different expectations yeah. Yeah. about yeah. how they yeah. wish yeah. to be dealt with and how they want family members dealt with. So does the, this convention, 2006 convention, does it encourage the mainstreaming of people with intellectual disabilities in schools? Well, that's the way it's been interpreted in New Zealand and, and I think elsewhere as well. Um, in a broader way, it encourages equal opportunities to education. And so um, what's happened in New Zealand is um, that largely that's been evidenced by the mainstreaming. Right. And so... Um, young people and children with considerable disabilities have been, with um, personal assistance, placed in schools with other yeah. learners, students. Yeah. And sometimes that's been disruptive when the process hasn't been handled well, which is why mm. I think your point about including everybody mm. in the discussion mm. uh, at uh, the outset is such so a helpful So I guess the, the, the principle behind the convention is to say we will no longer regard people with disabilities as a particular problem 
that we can treat in isolation, but we'll see them as fully functioning and fully entitled members of society. Who are able to make their own different contribution. contribution. Yeah. yeah. And we need to accommodate that. I guess yeah. the challenge, and this must, this must apply particularly in the legal sphere, is that people with certain disabilities, while they have the rights to participate as equal members of society, they have certain needs and problems that we also have to compensate for yes. in order that they're prote properly protected. Yes, well I think um, in my experience in the criminal law, for example, is um, uh, that of course uh, the law applies to those who are disabled at the point of trial because there have to be procedures to assess whether uh, they're sufficiently knowledgeable to be able to plead to a charge, uh, whether they're able to stand trial and so forth. Um, and we have, um, it, it is a requirement of the convention that legislation changes to make sure that there are civilised procedures to assess and make those decisions. Right. And then having made them to accommodate uh, what is found to be um, the circumstance. For example, we have some legislation um, about intellectual disability of, of offenders. And these are a group of, of people, often I've seen in prison, who are not um, criminally insane, so they've been able to plead to a charge, but they are so um, intellectually disadvantaged that they don't fully understand the right. consequences and um, have very much greater needs to rehabilitation than ordinary prisoners have. And we have a particular piece of legislation which deals with that category of prisoner, um, and we have hearing formal hearings around it. And I'm attracted to what you said right at the outset, that restorative processes around that involving everyone affected uh, ought to be included in those procedures. So um, that person, whatever the outcome, is going to be properly supported by the affected, right. his yeah. or her affected yeah. community. And I guess it's also important that that person is, is involved and it's not being Has done to be on central. their behalf or done for them. I, I think. think that's a very important point. Um, it's a, it's a yeah. central issue yeah. in the convention. So I guess the tension is always going to be how do, how do we uh, empower the disabled person to speak for themselves, to ha take, have a choice in, in things that are done uh, to be involved in the decision making process while recognising they're also going to need special support and guardianship I suppose. You're absolutely right. We've got a very good example which can be seen as flowing from the convention in what's called the homeless courts uh, set up in New Zealand now. And these are special courts based on therapeutic jurisprudence mm. models um, which bring to court um, those who are homeless and who've been involved in minor offending yeah. to deal with um, not the, um, the symptoms but the central problems. Right. And so those courts um, have in them people who can do mental health assessments, yeah. uh, drug and alcohol addiction experts, particularly important to the housing people and um, uh, Maori Pacific Island communities mm. uh, who are able to give support after proper assessment. Mm. And the, so the purpose of those courts is to place the person with a disability at the centre of it and then make sure that they receive the support, right. the encouragement, the promotion uh, that they need yeah. and are proving very successful. Yeah. I mean, it's such a mind, mindset shift, isn't it, to sort of think yeah. of these, these as problems to be solved, not just as people to be punished or controlled. Yeah, absolutely. But to look at the cause. And we all benefit. The, we all benefit. Yeah. 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 And, and I guess the disabled person themselves is, is not a spectator on what's happening, is actually involved in it, but is supported. I think with, that's with what the, um, the, the convention requires of um, nations who join it. In New Zealand, there are... Um, two mechanisms, a government mechanism, so there is a Minister of the Crown whose special responsibility is disability, there's an Office of um, Disability Issues, there is a Commissioner uh, for Disability Issues, all of whom have a high level um, need to look at legislation to um, advocate and promote um, disabled rights. And then there's an independent mechanism consisting of um, Crown entities, the Ombudsman's Office, Human Rights, and a convention, a coalition of um, disabled people themselves who are, uh, have much more to do with the groundwork, the challenges mm -hmm. of education that you've just talked mm -hmm. about, uh, criminal justice intersection and the many other challenges. 
So it's a journey, not an event, mm. no, joining this mm. convention. Mm. And it's a journey which involves us all, which is where RJ fits so neatly, I think. There's a, another area which is interesting, and that is of housing, which is a problem for us in New Zealand at the moment, and access to good housing. Can you see RJ processes being helpful in those considerations? Hmm. In what way, in terms of... Well, again, I suppose it's... Um, there are fundamental rights, right to family, right yeah. to family life. Yeah. Um, and families sometimes are ambivalent about a person with disability. Yeah. But yeah. including them seems very important in yes. these important yeah. decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and I guess the challenges are, 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 are going to be the same again, which the danger, I suppose, when with a person with disabilities and you stress community support... <clears throat> is that the person themselves drops out of the picture and it's done, it's done on their behalf. Yeah. So I guess the challenge for judges maybe here um, and for professionals is to, to really work at, um, to use restorative language, empowering the person to be involved, fully involved in their own, in, in their own issues. Yeah. You know, while at the, same t and at the same time bringing in the community and family support. And I, I think restorative practices, the, the kind of things that I, I've always found important in every application of restorative justice is the need for adequate preparation of the parties. I, yeah. I think in sort of standard of restorative justice involvement, we talk about pre-conferencing, which is working with both sides, victim side and the offender side often, um, independently before you bring them together. And that's where the really important work is done. It builds mm. trust. Um, it means a kind of no surprises situation. I think would be important in this in this context. Um, it, it enables people to get their story told, uh, to get clarified on 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 processes and facts. So I, I would think in this in processes of and processes that deal with uh, people with disabilities, preparation of the parties would be really important. I would think. I think that's a very good point. It's interesting how when you and I talk, we, um, we default back to people and the problems of people in the ordinary yeah. life. But there's two layers of this. Uh, one of them is something that only governments can do. And I imagine that that's um, things like um, making sure there's adequate information yeah. and data, yeah. Yeah. Uh, making sure that there's a good assessment of what money or resources need to be involved, and those... Uh, that's the job of government, I suppose, mm. to make those particular provisions. And you and I are concerned about the people at the end of it all yeah. and the way in which they can be dealt with respectfully, which is what we tend to talk about when we talk about restorative justice straight away. Mm. And that's, that makes sense to me in terms of it being relation, relational in the way that you explained right from the outset. My experience, um, I suppose, sadly, has been with court hearings hearings about the committal process for those who um, have mental disorders and are dangerous in some way mm. to themselves or others, um, hearings about fitness to plead, um, insanity and so forth. Um, we have a series of mental health review tribunals that have um, jurisdiction over those who've been committed. In those formal procedures, do you see restorative principles being helpful and um, adding value? Oh, uh, certainly. And I think probably the, the, the problem-solving courts you mentioned before would be the mm. way to go, wouldn't they? Um, but to make sure... Uh, the, the way I could imagine a restorative analysis being applied to those situations would be uh, you know, to make sure that there's adequate preparation of the parties before the hearing, to make mm. sure that there are people who support the person and, and, and are there primarily as the supporters of the person um, to have somebody who can perhaps help um, facilitate the conversation. Now I know it's a wee bit different in a court because the judge is the one who is in a sense the facilitator but I, I suppose when a person hmm. has, has mental disabilities, intellectual disabilities, being sure that they really do understand what's going on uh, would be important. Hmm. And so to have somebody who could work uh, and, and, and speak on their behalf, I imagine, would make, would make a difference. 
uh, the involvement we've already talked about already the involvement of of, uh, of a circle of people who have a stake in it, the members of the community, uh, yeah. representatives of the disabled community, uh, family members, friends, um, involving them in the process would be, would be important. Uh, another aspect of um, care for the disabled is the number of um, sheltered accommodation arrangements of varying types that are provided, mm -hmm. often run by voluntary organisations, churches and other mm -hmm. groups. And uh, they face, um, in uniquely different ways, I think, problems in living communally in some institutions. Right. Have you seen restorative practices being used in institutional settings? I haven't personally. Um, do you mean for if there is a, an argument between residents or if there is some... Those things and the ordinary um, aspects of promoting <laughs> monitoring, protecting rights. Yep. There are the difficult questions about disabled people and um, their rights to sexual lives yep. and family lives, yep. Yep. Um, which are sometimes decided for them yep. in a way which seems inimical to the ideas yep. you've talked about. Yeah. Mm. No, I haven't. I haven't seen it personally, <coughs> and I think, as you said before, this is a journey we're we're all on. Yeah. I think within the restorative justice movement, we're on this journey of asking just how do these principles make a difference in every area of life and. So I guess the same, the same concerns you'd want to make sure are, are, are catered for in terms of, um, of the person participating in the decision, having others there to support. Um, yeah. Well, one area where I think I have seen some uh, problems arise is when there has been uh, an offence committed by a person with some mental or intellectual disability, and the victim is a is a is a doesn't have that problem. Mm. And because restorative justice uh, is very concerned about creating an environment where empathy can flow between the parties, where they can understand one another and understand how each side has been affected by the incident, uh, this this can be a little problematic if the person, for example, has um, Asperger's. Yeah, uh, syndrome or, or something like that, where their ability to read emotions and to and to and to pick up on signals is is more limited. So, you're, you're right. <coughs> we are fortunate in New Zealand with the family group conference system in our youth justice area, uh, which I think shows a possible way of dealing with those problems because there's now increasing evidence about um, brain maturity yeah. um, to show that a lot of young people are not yet. Um, able to make mature decisions, no surprise to anyone. Mm. Some of us old people don't make all that good decision <laughs> either. Um, but um, uh, it's a matter of sharing that knowledge and making sure that everyone who's affected understands. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that seems to fit very squarely with what you said at the yeah. outset yeah. about um, being inclusive, uh, getting yeah. everyone who's aff affected, and then sharing it openly mm. so that there's mm. no um, uh, preconception about yeah. things. Yeah. And I think behind that, I guess there is a deeper belief we have, which is that when you bring people together to encounter each other in these situations of real, of real pain and struggle and difficulty, that people have this remarkable capacity to find solutions that benefit. Yeah. Well, you and everybody. I have seen that, haven't we? See that all the time. Yeah. And it's like you can go into it thinking, what on earth can we do? But somehow, there's a chemistry that occurs in the meeting where solutions emerge that people could never have imagined. Um, and I think that's, that really is, that's why I talked about it being a democratic process because yeah. so often in our, in our institutional system, particularly in the judicial systems, we have people making decisions for other people, handing down decisions that have to be fulfilled, the experts deciding. But when you have a process where you, as much as is possible, you get people involved in making the decisions for themselves and for people they care for, then all kinds of creative well, options. Well, you, you and I have both seen that. I, there is a place for handing down decisions too. I don't want to get rid of all the judges for obvious reasons, <laughs> uh, uh, no, Professor. The, the laws be a need for you. <laughs> Thank you. But it's, it interests me um, in view of what you've just said to hear from youth court judges today in New Zealand, given much more information about neuro disability yeah. And the problems, for example, of um, 
young people who've got fetal alcohol syndrome and other yeah, yeah. Um, accident, brain injury accidents, that if that information is made is shared with all those who are significant and uh, affected, then silly decisions like keeping bowel conditions, which are just impossible for someone yeah, yeah. Uh, with a brain injury, yeah. are not imposed. Yeah. And then we don't have racked up consequences which just yeah. get worse and yeah. worse yeah. because we've been realistic right from the start. Yeah. So those sorts of quite easy wins yep. yeah. uh, are gained if everyone knows what's yeah. happening. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so much of our system is built on the assumption that everybody has this kind of rational capacity to plan yeah. their lives into the future and young people we know don't. I mean, today's today's today, tomorrow's, <laughs> tomorrow's yeah. not worth thinking about. So I guess the extent to which we learn that and try to build a system or build into the system um, ways of accommodating those realities are better off where we all are. Well, I, um, it's interesting as we've talked, it seems to me that um, more and more ideas come forward about ways in which we can be helpful to um, mm. fellow citizens who mm. suffer from disability. And I'm, I'm sure it'll be the uh, experience in Taiwan, just as it's been here, that within a different culture, with different people and different expectations and different ways of living, there are opportunities for promoting and monitoring and protecting those rights, which are equally valid for them mm. uh, and are respectful and inclusive mm. in the way that you've um, mm. outlined restorative processes are. And everybody will win, won't they? I mean, I, yeah. I think governments often worry, what's this going to cost us to do this? Yeah. But the more that we provide full participation and membership and equality for people in society, everybody wins. Uh, the more that we exclude or, 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 um, or ignore groups in society, then I think society as a whole is, is the loser. Well, I've, that's a very good note to finish on, but we probably haven't done half an hour yet. We must be new. <laughs> we have. Have we? <laughs> Brilliant finish. Uh, <laughs> You're a natural. 